Now this week, Toyota outlined plans for a new generation of electric cars. And while many other automakers are crowing about 300 or 400 mile range, Toyota says, hold my beer, and says that in a few years, its cars could get more than 600 miles on a fast charge. Now, that got our interest. Toyota also is working on so-called solid state batteries, like other people are, by the way, that in a few years could be another dagger in the heart of the piston engine. We've been hearing about it for a decade or so now, that Toyota has made some sort of breakthrough in solid state battery technology, and they're on the cusp of commercializing it in a fast charging, affordable electric vehicle for the masses. It's like a boy who cried wolf story, where even the Institute of Electric and Electronics Engineers wrote about Toyota's latest solid state battery claim with a caveat that said, however, it's wise to take any Toyota EV messaging with a grain of salt. And I'm no Toyota hater by any means. My family has always been a Toyota family. When I was born in the early 80s, my parents were driving a Celica Supra, and a few years later, they turned it in for a Toyota Camry. By the time I was 15 years old, we had gone through three different Camrys. I knew nothing of any other car make and probably didn't even sit in anything other than Toyota until I was an adult. Throughout my teenage years, I became obsessed with the Mark IV Supra. Naturally, as it was the best car Toyota was putting out at the time, and this was before the Fast and the Furious even came out. So I got a job in high school to save up for a down payment for the cheapest one I could find and end up finding one I did. It was a 1993 and a half Alpine Silver Twin Turbo. The air conditioning didn't work. It had large dents in the rear quarter panels. In the target top, it leaked when it rained. But I loved that car, and I think about it to this very day. But I started drifting away from the brand as the years went on. Nothing Toyota was putting out was all that inspiring from a technological aspect or even a performance one. And we know Toyota is all about volume sales of affordable cars that are gas efficient. It's not surprising their hybrid Prius was received so well, and it was no coincidence it was released around the discontinuation of the Supra. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, reducing one's carbon footprint wasn't just a fad anymore. It became a lifestyle, and hybrids made it possible. Though it didn't hurt to get more miles per gallon as the prices of gas climbed throughout the financial crisis. The motivation for energy efficiency was even stronger in Japan than here in America because we have vast amounts of oil reserves at our disposal, whereas Japan has essentially none at all. This means all our hydrocarbon-based energy is imported. This includes oil, natural gas, and even coal. That resource scarcity leaves a country vulnerable to energy shocks, and if you thought oil was expensive during the 1970s oil crisis, it was felt doubly in Japan. And that was when their government decided they needed to hedge their oil dependency somehow, some way. Japan's economic success is all the more incredible when we remember that the country has very few raw materials and almost no energy supplies. It was a combination of good luck and good management which brought about Japan's economic miracle. The luck consisted of low prices for energy and raw materials and the general growth of world trade throughout the 1950s and 60s. The good management rested on close links between government and business. Governments helped business by means of low taxes. Tariffs were put on imports to fend off foreign competition. Japanese culture has a strong element of national pride, loyalty, and a feeling that all should work together for the benefit of bettering the country as a whole. That includes corporations. The concept is sometimes referred to as group spirit or the vertical society. It's not that the government has state-owned companies that can enact our policy and will through them, like how it's done in China. It's more indirect than that, but Japanese corporations fall into line whenever the government needs them to. After all, it's for the greater good of the people. Policy or subsidies can direct the whole of their industry towards long-term goals. And I mean long. Sometimes their overarching plans can be decades in the making. They're patient and they don't get knocked off their path so easily. The Prius was a culmination of one of those plans, almost 30 years in length. Those aforementioned oil shocks of the 70s may spur the government body named the Ministry of International Trade and Industry to fund research and development efforts in battery electric vehicle technology. Those efforts didn't bear fruit even after years of trying. The technology wasn't mature enough, but it wasn't all in vain because by the 90s, Toyota figured out a way to blend internal combustion engines and battery technology in a relatively affordable vehicle, the Prius, of course. However, the immediate problem is the oil crisis. Will the energy saving measures be enough? Is more nuclear fuel the answer? But is this a real option in a country which alone has suffered nuclear attack? In a country with severe earthquakes, could the Japanese really turn to nuclear fuel? 
So you're probably thinking that this success in a partially battery powered vehicle would lead to all these cute stories about solid state battery technologies. No, not really. It leads us to the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Because you see, solid state batteries have never been and still are the focus of a long term plan set forth by the Japanese government. Sure. Recently, they might have set aside $800 million in subsidies to support the solid state battery industry this past June, but that pales in comparison to what they're investing after the explosion and subsequent meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. It seemed like the perfect solution to wean off its dependency from oil and coal by splitting the atom. The year before the accident, 29% of Japan's electricity was generated by nuclear power, and they had a roadmap to increase that share to 40% by 2017. But as of today, it amounts to just around 10%, which of course means they're importing 90% of their sources of energy. And as geopolitical tensions rise in the Pacific, energy is becoming a national security issue now more so than ever. The government had to do something. In 2014, they figured it out. Hydrogen. In a paper titled The Strategic Energy Plan, the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry of Japan outlines structural issues with their energy infrastructure, long-term measures to secure energy supply by reinforcing relations with oil-rich nations, and fostering a secondary energy source, or in their words, the realization of a hydrogen society. Do you remember the $800 million solid state battery subsidy I mentioned earlier? Well, compare that to the hydrogen subsidy of the yen equivalent of $107 billion. We just heard about these great advances in their battery technology and their infrastructure they're building to support it, like the joint venture between Toyota and Itamitsu Kosan to accelerate solid state battery development. The partnership will construct a pilot facility to test their ideas by 2027, though the two tempered expectations, saying they anticipate they'll need three additional years to come out with a commercial product thereafter. They're aiming for 2030 to put these batteries into mass production. So you have to wonder, as Tesla was scaling up manufacturing their Model S and Model 3 throughout the mid to late 2000 teens, Toyota was going all in on hydrogen, turning a blind eye to what was happening in the automotive industry? Maybe. But you're probably thinking, by now, they got the picture, and they're not just piloting a solid-state battery production, but they're planning a whole new lineup of solid-state battery electric vehicles, right? Um, not necessarily. Because Toyota's chief scientist, Gil Pratt, said in an interview with Autoline that solid-state batteries would be first used in their hybrid vehicles instead of fully electric ones. I don't think you're actually surprised about these revelations anymore, and the industry and analysts aren't either, because it wasn't but in 2020 when the Japanese government wanted to pass legislation banning the sale of gasoline and diesel engines by 2035, Akio Toyota, the CEO of the car maker, would intervene and squeeze in a provision that hybrid cars can still be sold, much to the ire of climate change proponents worldwide. It's peculiar because the whole point of the hydrogen society was to decrease the reliance of fossil fuels. So why would Toyota resist? Well, it's all about jobs. The automotive sector in Japan employs 5.5 million people. And as many car enthusiasts know, battery electric vehicles would greatly reduce the manpower needed to manufacture such a car. Eventually, the stock market would grow weary of this stance until it was reversed in December of 2021 when Toyota would introduce via CGI and mock-ups a slew of new battery electric vehicles with the aim to sell 3.5 million zero emission cars by 2030. The EV era is an opportunity and a chance for more variety and more fun. An EV for you, an EV for me, and an EV for everyone. Oh good, all is well now. We'll get these solid state batteries up and running and toss them into millions of BEVs. Actually, no. I got ahead of myself again, because in September of 2022, Akio Toyota announced they'll be slow walking the company's battery electric vehicle transition. An article from CNBC describes how the close relationship between the Japanese businesses and government failed them this time around. The CEO said he would need to convince skeptics in the government that completely battery powered electric vehicles are actually desired and they have a greater environmental benefit than previously thought. Shortly after these comments from Akio, the automaker would prepare its suppliers for a change in vision. Perhaps Akio realized the error of his way and somehow convinced the government that BEVs were the only way forward in the car industry. The weird thing was, the memo the suppliers were sent stated they were canceling all of their electrified vehicle plans and will submit new guidance in January of 2023. But everyone didn't expect that along with that new guidance, CEO Toyota would step down to be replaced with a younger Lexus CEO, 
Koji Sato. So there we have it, right? The young upstart will be more in touch and get Toyota on the right path. Everything is fixed. Toyota is going to make BEVs and do their damnedest to catch up to Tesla. No, not really. Because Sato will double down on hydrogen and hypercars as part of Toyota's future. When asked during an appearance at an endurance race on March 18th of this year, he said, We want to ensure that hydrogen stays a viable option. We need a production and transport supply chain. Unless we see evolution there, we cannot expect a volume increase in the energy's use. Japan is vowing to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Its ambitious plan focuses on emerging technologies, hydrogen and ammonia as alternative fuels and carbon capture technology. His comments highlight one of the most ironic topics about Japan's hydrogen society. No one is asking for it. The company itself is trying to ensure hydrogen is viable. Why is it their responsibility to do that? There's not a vast infrastructure system in place for the creation or transport of hydrogen with just one, one hydrogen liquefied carrier ship having been made. You might ask me, why would they even need to make a ship to transport hydrogen? Isn't water all around Japan and water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen? Everyone knows you can use electrolysis to separate the two elements. So what's the deal? Great question. See, the problem is they need more electricity. Electrolysis facilities would strain their already tight electrical grid. Even with public wariness of nuclear power plants, Japan is having to turn on reactors that were previously offline due to the aftermath of Fukushima Daiichi. As for nuclear, polls now show a slim majority support restarting nuclear plants. Ten reactors are now generating power after meeting new stringent safety requirements. The Japanese government would like to restart 17 more. Anyways, why would Japan want to turn a grid that is powered by 90% fossil fuels to try to turn water into a clean burning source of energy? Kind of defeats the purpose, right? Right? Well, it's going to get really awkward now because a study by the Tokyo-based REI, which stands for Renewable Energy Institute, found that 86% of hydrogen the country will consume would be gray hydrogen, a name given to hydrogen that is sourced from natural gas. And to compound that awkwardness, some of the places Japan precursed its hydrogen use electricity generated from the burning of coal to turn natural gas into hydrogen, places such as Australia. You're beginning to see Japan is deep, deep into this hydrogen transition, and the government is pushing for it to be the source of energy for almost every sector, manufacturing, trains, trucks, shipping, and even residential power. Oh, and we can't forget about the automobile sector. But maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe people do want hydrogen-powered vehicles. Let's find out. So it looks like Toyota makes one hydrogen fuel cell car called the Mirai. Maybe you haven't seen it though. The reason for that is the only state it's available in is California due to the difficulty in storing and transporting supercooled hydrogen. This car has been available since 2014, nine years of production and sales. As the end of last year, only 21,475 were sold worldwide. To put that number in perspective, Tesla would be able to sell a similar number of vehicles in one week. It's obvious Japan is much more serious about hydrogen than it is about solid state batteries. So why does Toyota always bring up groundbreaking battery technologies every few years then? Well, coming across a pamphlet that the Japanese government and their automobile lobby would distribute to school children helped me understand a bit better. They're buying time. They know they're in the early innings of their hydrogen society. And just like how the Prius sprung up from over 20 years of development after their oil shocks, the government and the automakers are hoping for that moment, but for hydrogen energy, though it will likely take many years. So they'll drop a teaser here and there about a new patent they developed or a new partnership they signed to make solid state batteries, hoping investors and the public at large will get off their back for another six months. The indoctrination of school children, extolling the benefits of hybrid and hydrogen vehicles, and then explaining the supply chain that employs millions without any mention of battery electric vehicles, says Japan is digging in for this fight. They have too much on the line. They will become the physical embodiment of sunk cost fallacy.